Hey, I'm Decathlon Gamer, and welcome to a Pro Cycling Manager 2023 Complete Guide to Training and Development of Riders in Career Mode. Now, this guide is designed for everyone. If you are new to Pro Cycling Manager 2023, you're going to find this tremendously helpful. If you are an experienced veteran player of Pro Cycling Manager 2023, you might find a new tip or two useful to you as it is a complete guide. Now, let's go ahead and jump in, beginning with the trainers. Trainers are a key member of your staff and it is one of the most important areas to dump some money into. Now in terms of progression for your riders, these trainers are probably the number one most important element of that progression. One aspect that will matter to you is salary, but it does not matter to progression. There are four elements of your trainer that will matter in terms of progression of riders and I'll go over each of the four and which of the four is most important down to the least important. Beginning with the most important, that is style. Style is the pivotal difference in whether a trainer is effective or not. There are three types of style in terms of training within the game. And it also turns out that style is very telling regarding your rider and how close they are to the end. Now, there are exceptions within this rule. However, a traditional style means they are just about complete in leveling up. You can have somebody who is just starting out and comes in traditional style, but it is by far the exception to the rule. And I recommend never having more than one of these on staff because you're gonna find very few writers require traditional style. Or as long as you play the game and the manner in which I do and you don't have an Alejandro Valverde on your team and a bunch of old guard making up your lineup. I keep them young and keep them fresh and keep them rotating and as they hit their peak they're moving on to other teams because their salaries are insane and I play with small teams. The next style, the neutral style, is modern. These are riders that have progressed a fair bit already. They're reaching the tail end of their development and their progression is starting to back off a bit. It's possible that you might need two modern trainers, but most likely one modern trainer will be sufficient for your squad uh, to, to meet your needs. But the last and most important style is groundbreaking. Groundbreaking is for the young, high potential riders that are going to develop and level up a lot. And they should be the bulk of your squad. If you're playing a long-term career, it's not just season number one, you very well, if you're picking the right riders, will have the majority, the vast majority of the riders you hire as groundbreaking style. You will almost certainly need at least two groundbreaking trainers, possibly a third if you have a large team. The second most important category is reputation. According to salary, it might suggest that reputation is the most important because salary is tied to reputation and as you look legendary the highest reputation available to the trainers the highest of four reputations they all come in at 30,000 but you can see that other legendary trainers come in at 25,000 the difference is style and so that's a good indicator of why groundbreaking is better than modern higher salary the traditional even lower and as we get down to the second tier of reputation international this groundbreaking is only 15,000 so it's less than the traditional it's less than the modern however you know, I will easily argue the point that the style matters more so a international trainer at 15,000 is more valuable to your team than a traditional trainer who costs 20,000 do not waste that traditional money, especially if you have a budget on a legendary trainer, unless it is groundbreaking legendary, because they are literally the best trainers available to you and will be the most efficient at developing your riders. But first and foremost, match style. The third most important thing for your trainers is to not overwork them. They have a limit, they have a capacity. They can train nobody or anywhere from one up to eight athletes without uh, incurring a penalty. After eight, from nine on, they are gonna be less efficient and you want to avoid that at all costs. 
if you have, let's say 10 groundbreaking writers on your team and you have two modern writers on your team and just 12 writers overall and you have a very small team and a very small budget and you already have some staff that's hired and you don't want to have to fire and hire new ones, one of the best things you can do in, in those circumstances is take the eight best writers that you have and assign them to that groundbreaking trainer. Then take the four writers that are left, including your two weakest groundbreaking writers, and assign them to your modern trainer. You want those eight writers to progress as well as possible. You're sacrificing a couple of them to be a little less efficient by putting them under somebody of a different style, but workload is pretty important. So make sure you're not overworking. And finally, in regards to your trainer, the fourth category that m matters most is relationships. You could find that here under squad and trainers and the relations, they fall off. Especially the lower the quality, lower the reputation of your trainer, the more likely they are to have issues with riders. One of the nice things about having multiple groundbreaking trainers on your team is that when relationships fall out between say Bitsimana and Ali, I can switch to Uimana. And then the guy that I that I took Uimana away from, you put him on Ali to keep them both balanced on that workload portion, but you can rotate trainers around. If your traditional trainer has bad relationships with all of your writers, best thing for you is probably to just find a new traditional relationship trainer when the time comes, when the time is right. Their contract is expiring at the end of the season, let it run its course, hire somebody new in December to replace them to get a better relationship. If you're still on a tight budget and you're spending that minimum, that's probably why that relationship is difficult to manage. The reputation's low, they want to hire a reputation trainer, but you can only do so much with the budget you have. When and where you can manage those relationships. You will get an email when a relationship falls to three stars or below, letting you know that the relationship is strained. That is not the end of the world. If you can fix it, fix it. If you have an alternative, use the alternative. But if you don't, it's better to have strained relationship than no relationship at all. It's the weakest element of the four in terms of development from your trainers. One thing that it can often indicate you can see here that a number of my writers show what their style is, but I have a question mark for a number of others. Chances are a majority of the question marks are groundbreaking if they're young. And if you look at my roster and our age, I've got a bunch of 19 and 20 year olds that make up almost the entire squad and just three writers over the age of 25 and just two over the age of 30 on my squad. That you can already see the three oldest writers the only traditional ones. The next oldest writer is modern. One of the quickest ways to figure it out when you get some new writers into your team, assign them to your traditional trainer. Relationships will probably get strained real fast within a matter of a couple of months. The training will not be very effective during those couple of months, but what it will do is it'll bring that relationship from five stars down to that three stars or below quite quickly. And then in the email, they'll tell you that their training style is not for me. And then poof, you have your answer. That's one of the ways that I have knowledge of what style a lot of these writers are is because they had strained relationships and then it reveals what their actual style is. So that's a quick way, quick trick to figure that out a little bit faster. However, it's not a big deal for me to not know that Johannes Delek is groundbreaking. He's been with the same trainer for a couple of years. We don't know anything. Why? Because they have a good relationship and it's working. If it's a good relationship and it's working, chances are behind the scenes, it's groundbreaking. We just don't have it showing, but it doesn't actually make any difference. When it comes to writers themselves, the most important element of all in writer selection is their potential. Here for Johannes Dalek, that is displayed. His current is the yellow, his potential is the blue. Same in the web. More important than the overall potential where he's current three stars and potential is four stars is the actual breakdown, what his strengths are or what his strengths can be. 
Now, Johannes Dalek is pretty well-rounded. De Villiers, on the other hand, has specific strengths and then other weaknesses. So he's very much focused as a future sprinter. After potential, the next most important thing is current ability because you want a writer who's going to be successful. You want a writer who is not the worst writer in the world that might have some potential eventually and you have to wait 10 years for him to reach it. You want somebody who's pretty decent now and is going to be amazing or is good now and will be a bit better later. Age is a really telling factor when it comes to potential versus current. Older writers, beginning at about 28 to 29 years of age, will see their attributes decrease over time more rapidly the older they get. So even if they have potential remaining, a 31-year-old is not going to see it. Ryan Gibbons, for example, at 31 years of age, still has remaining potential as a sprinter. I still train him. He can make certain gains, but his overall, his attributes across the board will begin, if they haven't already, to see drop-offs here and there, and points will fall away. So in that case, younger is always better when possible, with the exception that younger generally means they are not at their potential yet. So you have to balance your competitive here and now versus the long-term development choices that you're going to make in signing writers. But this is not a tutorial necessarily about that, so we'll move on from that aspect and cover one key thing regarding training and the age, the current ability, and potential ability of your writers, and that being their level. Progression of writers is based on a leveling system, and within this game there are 20 levels available to your writers. So they can only level up a total of 20 times throughout their career. There's never a for sure, unless you go into the database itself to look, to know just how far along they are in the leveling system. There's XP involved experience and there's trigger points at a certain experience you level up. So you gain XP, you cross over into a new level and you see a rise in attributes. Now, some of what happens within the rise is random. Some of that happens through a certain design, partially through the potential that remains versus the current ability of your writers. Some of that has to do with the style of training that you have selected for that particular writer, which means they're more likely to get attribute points within that area. But how many they get, how much progress they make from level to level, a lot of it's with a roll of the dice type random uh, element that takes place. But there's odds, and the odds favor certain things over other. But one thing that is clear here with Gibbons, as you look at the evolution tab, which this one, by the way, the evolution tab, it's broken. Okay, This is a bugged system. It, it works for some writers. It shows up properly for some writers. It does not work at all for others. Gibbons has not progressed at all. In fact, we are starting to see the decline. Here lately, he has had his attributes fall off. But back with Johannes Delek, who's now 20 years of age, you can see back in July, this last calendar year, he progressed. That's a level up. You can see how multiple disciplines improved at that time, but not all. Also, I could see earlier that year, and then again at the end of the prior year, he leveled up. There are three level ups right here for Johannes Stalek out of the 20 that he could get over his career. That's a lot in a short period of time. And you get the most level ups when you are youngest because the XP required is less. And over time, the gap between levels gets larger and larger and larger and it takes more and more XP to continue leveling up. So the, the first levels are the easiest ones. Later levels are the hardest to get. But here we can already see and identify three levels that he has gained. If I continue back, there's a fourth and a fifth and a sixth level. 
at his age, my guess right now is that we're looking at somebody who is seven levels in out of 20. So he's got quite a ways to go in his progression track, but he's also at a stage where it's going to start to slow down a little bit. We're not going to see him get three levels a year, but we're probably going to see him get two levels a year for the next couple of years before it slows down further. That's one tip to keep an eye on. But like I said, that graph does not always function properly. So don't freak out if it doesn't, but it's a great indicator or an estimate of how far along a rider is on their progression track. And it can give you an indication anyway of how fast to expect. Levels one through five are 100 XP apart. So each level takes just 100 XP to, to gain. So those five levels happen really fast. After that, it starts to slow down. It literally doubles to 200 XP per level, beginning with level six and going through level nine. Starting with level 10, it goes to 300. Same for 11, 12. But then at 13, it goes to 400. At 15, it goes to 500. At 17, it goes to 600. And at 19, it goes to 700. Your trainers provide the most consistent accumulation of XP that you're going to get. It's the most rapid way to develop. So the trainers are very, very important to progress. Also, groundbreaking is the most rapid of the styles of training. And mostly, the youngest riders are the ones that are groundbreaking. So that double combination of the trainer being the most effective and the style being the most effective of the styles available means early on riders level up fastest. Later on, that relationship with trainers or the style of trainers that they have means they are gonna get less XP out of training than the younger riders are getting. That modern and especially that traditional, they gain fewer and fewer XP points over time out of training making it less effective. But then the gap between the levels is also greater. So they have further ground to cover and they do it at a slower rate. Fortunately, training is not the only way that progression occurs within the game. Experience also adds XP to your riders. So the more they ride, the more they are going to progress. So that's why riders without teams don't progress as fast. It's also an indicator that it's important to you to have your best potential riders get some experience, throw them in as domestiques for some extra races, or when you have a spot to fill in a minor race, utilize them, utilize those with the most to gain because that experience will help them level up faster. And not only does experience help, but results help. The more they perform in races, the more experience they are going to gain from those races and therefore getting them in situations where they can perform is that much more useful to develop it. So other than having a trainer with the right style who has the best reputation you can afford, who has a good relationship with their rider, who has a young rider who has high potential and a long ways to go to meet it yet because they are still a low level, what do you do with them? training wise besides put them in races. Well, that comes down to looking at your web matrix. And this is something that I do at the beginning of every season. And usually I'll check in at some point over the course of a year, you know, maybe in May or June, I'll check in on it once and, and change it if necessary. What this comes down to is looking at that web matrix and where that potential exists. Now, as much as I like this, it's only so much of an indicator. This web can get you right down to within a point or two of what their potential is. Like looking at somebody here probably can reach about a 7980 in time trial. Pretty good, really good in time trial. But how do I know what to choose? Because Johannes Dalek has potential everywhere within this web. Now, one of the obvious things is if you don't have potential remaining. Gibbons, okay, fine. Let's ignore for a second that he's 31 and not really going to progress. It's still possible. So I still carefully choose what it is I want him to train in. 
which I have him set to train in sprinting. But his mountain, it's maxed out. I could have Gibbons level up five times and train as a climber, which is the mountain rating, and he won't gain a single point because he's already reached, reached his max potential in that area. So make sure that it's something that they still have room for growth in. Gibbons is not the best sprinter he could be. Even though he's going to lose attribute points over time, it does not mean that he is not going to continue gaining XP. Traditional style means it's going to happen slowly but he participates in races and those races are going to accumulate XP. He is a sprinter, he's got 11 victories, but he could perform on rare occasions and accumulate additional XP. The levels might be spread out for him, but that doesn't mean he's not going to at some point trigger a level up and see his attributes that have been decreasing rise again. Since he's a sprinter and because he still has potential there, I train him as a sprinter. Speaking of, here is the web ma matrix and how to read it and what areas you might want to train and which ones you don't want to train. GC is stage races. It is a combination of mountain and time trialing, stamina slash recovery. The way this matrix is borne out is stamina versus resistance. At the top end of this, we have the categories that train stamina as a byproduct the most. The bottom end of this trains resistance the most. So hills and sprint get resistance as a byproduct. Baradur, mountain, gets stamina as a byproduct. While cobble and time trial get a little bit neutral. They can get a little bit here and there of any, but not necessarily either stamina or resistance. But mountain is going to train your mountain rating and your medium mountain rating and the stamina. Time trial is going to be time trial prologue. Sprint, acceleration, flat plus that resistance hills is going to get a little bit of that medium mountain and then also it's going to get you acceleration cobble a little bit of acceleration a little bit of sprint a little bit of flat and especially the cobble rating barador the least useful one you should never train as a barador unless you have filled up the entire rest of the matrix and it's all that's left and it's your only option to find growth Go ahead. Or if you have the one rare member of your team who is there as a pure domestique, who has good flat rating and has potential for better flat rating, go ahead. But a domestique is more useful if they can climb or if they can get over the cobbles or if they are punchy when necessary or if they can sprint a little bit, then it is to have that flat rating, that extra point or two there. But Baradour is going to train flat and stamina most of all. In terms of what to train, that's up to you. It's really what you want to get out of that rider. What's their best strength? What's the best potential they have to achieve? But not always is that gonna lead to going that one direction. For one thing, a lot of them have two to three specialties. So which specialty do you wanna train first? It's what do you need and how they can help you. If you're gonna go for stage races, if you wanna win the Tour de France, you're gonna not only need a leader, a Jonas Vingegaard who can climb, and time trial. You're going to need a Wild Van Art, a Sepkus. You're going to need a team surrounding that leader who can support that leader. When you have a single rider as your leader, the hopes of them succeeding are minimal because they don't have help. They don't have support when the climbs get tough. You need riders to protect. So the more climbers you have, if you want to focus on, on GC, the better. You need one of them to be great in the mountains and also in the time trial. The others, they just need to have that really high mountain rating to support because on when it comes to the individual time trial, they're on their own. Hills are certainly useful when you're climbing, but unless you're looking to win punchy stages, hills rating isn't as important. I prioritize climbers before punchers, but it is nice to have a couple of punchers on your roster. But I'll take 10 climbers and two punchers. Sprinters? or something that you don't need 20 of. You certainly need a leader of your sprint and you need a lead out rider for your sprinter. So you're gonna need two of them that are really good. If you have a busy calendar, you're gonna need three to maybe four sprinters, but that's maximum. Because after that, what's important in the train is the flat rating. Because the sprint is gonna come down to the last two riders. Ahead of them are the highest rated flat 
writers you have. It's actually a bare door and be useful to have one or two of those on your squad, especially if it's just a classic that has a sprint finish and not, not much climbing along the way. There's not very many of those on the calendar, but they can be handy. Time trialing is great if you're a GC favorite. Time trialing is great if you are the best time trialist and you're gonna get some wins in time trials. Time trialing is helpful if you have team time trials. Having some decent riders in the time trial will go a long way to helping you out. But it's less of a priority on small teams. It's less of a priority if you're working within a tight budget. Northern Classics, there's a wide number of them. There's a couple months on the calendar where there are a ton of one day classics that involve cobbled sectors. You need a full team of them to be successful at a Peru Bay, at a Rendez von Vlanderen. You're gonna need at least a handful of good cobbled riders. But again, if you're a small team, that's something you're gonna pick up over time. Having just one, like having the one strong climber and no support around them, is a recipe for failure. One good one alone isn't gonna do very well. Four good ones could do all right. But if you can amass a full team, if you can get seven well-rated cobbled riders, and one of them really good, your chances of success go up astronomically. So know the needs of your team to make the decisions of what to train them in. But what to train them in is very reliant on having that potential. Hanok is somebody who is best as a climber and or a puncher. For me, like I said, climbers are more useful than punchers. I'll take 10 good climbers and two good punchers and I will be very happy because a, one who can do both is far more useful to you because punchers, if they're not good climbers, unless it's one short little punchy finish and it's flat the whole way till it, you go over a hard climb earlier in the stage and they're in trouble and they might get dropped anyway. So that punch doesn't matter as much. But somebody who does both well means they're not gonna be tired before they get to that final climb and then they're gonna have enough energy left to make that hard push and go for the win. Good combination is definitely both. So I look for riders that are good in both instead of just punchy. But I'll train up mountain first, then I'll switch to punch when they've filled that out. Sprinters, I'll always wanna get them capable in the sprint first, but once they max that out, then I usually go for the climbing aspect or the punchy aspect, depending on what they have in sport, or the cobble rated, so that they get that secondary. Hanok has potential in time trialing beyond what he has right now, but it's not a high potential. So I will not train him as a stage racer. I train him as a climber because it's his mountain rating that is gonna be his greatest attribute when he gets maxed out eventually. Down the line, secondary options. Sprint is always a good one. If you're just about maxed out as a climber and you're just about maxed out as a puncher, go ahead and get that sprint. Reason being is he's more likely to start winning some races, some stages, when you add in that extra speed, that extra push for the finish line. But first and foremost, a rider of that style, he's got to climb. That's his job. Take care of that one. Here's a good example of priorities. Roteus here, his best potential is as a time trialist and he's fairly good already. I'm not training him as a time trialist, even though he still has potential and could maybe get some wins in that department. I've got a team that needs good classics riders and don't have it right now. And so even though his potential is not as high, right now I'm focused on getting him some points in cobble. From there, I will help him see out his potential as a time trialist, but right now, what I need for this team is a good classics rider, and he's here. I hired him because of the potential to do both, but I need one over the other more so, even though his potential is better in the other category. So a quick summary for you as we wrap this thing up. Trainers are the most important, beginning with style, then reputation, their workload, eight, keep it under, or keep it at eight or below, and then the relationship with their riders. Rider potential is most important for them. Burnability comes in next, but maybe you need somebody who's great right here, right now, and doesn't have potential remaining, and that's what works for you, that's fine. But their age is a good indicator of how far along they might be in their leveling system. And outside of 
the training aspect and what you pick within that web. Get them experience, get them results, and they'll level up faster. That's going to do it for this guide on training in career mode of Pro Cycling Manager 2023. I'm Nikhil Gamer. Thanks for tuning in. Like, comment, subscribe, and I'll see you next time. Have a good one. Be safe out there. Bye for now.